Exploring the natural world, one podcast episode at a time. This is For What It's Earth. Hi all, and thank you for joining me for another episode of For What It's Earth by me, Marissa Jacobs of the Art of Ecology, and Sam Rebeck here being my fun semi-permanent guest here for this mini series where we are going over climate change from sky to core. Last week, we focused on kind of terrestrial ecology, looking at the plants and the animals that live on land and how they might be impacted. We did kind of get a little off topic with the, uh, the whole cat thing, but hey, there are enough stressors for birds that uh, we don't need our cats to be continuing with that. But I will get off that little high horse now and let Sam kind of take over with this one as well. We're kind of rotating back and forth between what we are good at. And this week we are going to be focusing on climate change and its impact on soil or the, the crust. Here we've gone all the way down. Now I've got the I guess, what would you call it? Just the general composition of the earth, like terra firma. That sounds really sci-fi-y though. I know. (laughs) But I mean, whatever, (laughs) sure. (laughs) So I truly have no idea. And I tried to prep myself a little bit with this, just being like, can climate change even impact crust and mantle and core and all that stuff and the google was very interesting with its uh, responses there so i'm very curious to hear what your thoughts as the uh, geologist background person yeah i think my focus will be more on the impacts on soil okay um i'll be curious to know what the google box said about um uh, if it affects plate tectonics at all, because that will be interesting to know because I don't know. Oh, okay. All right. So then let's start with, um, my husband and I call Google the Oracle. So you could be like, I don't know, we, we must ask the Oracle for these divine answers. And then we just have it right there at our fingertips. Um, so the Oracle states via NASA. So, you know, Pretty, it's a pretty good science. source. Yeah, pretty good source. Is that the answer is yes and no. I was like, great, that's helpful. That sounds so, about right when it comes to science. Yeah, right. So they first started off saying that climate change in general, very generalized, does not. However, Climate change impacts things that do impact tectonics. So their kind of focus, this little article was on earthquakes and then the shifting of the plates, I guess. And it, um, it talked about water and how snow and severe storm effects will impact Um, with the freeze thaw cycle kind of, Mm -hmm. of moving earth around, especially then in conjunction with droughts. So it would be Mm -hmm. this high period of rain that kind of overwhelms the earth system and then disappears. So I, it was a very interesting little read, but what kind of struck me was that alternating periods of drought and heavy precipitation in Sierra Nevada between 2011 and 17 caused the mountain range itself to rise by an inch and fall by a half inch as the mountain rocks lost water and then regained it. (laughs) So there would be stressors then put on the faults that run along the Sierra Nevada's Mm -hmm. Because the whole mountain range is just boom, 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 bouncing up and down. So that was kind of what this article was about. And then how the um, glaciers, as they retreat, 
reduce stress loads on the crust, mm-hmm. which then allows magma to move and then boom, volcanoes. So that was what I found. Okay. Um, but it still was like, yeah, we're still studying it and it's not going to cause things super dramatic, but it's enough that right. we have noticed it. Right. And this kind of goes along with one of the, I forget when we brought it up, but how you, sometimes you don't know something's happening until it's like already happened. And that's how a lot of plate tectonics is because things move so slowly. Right. Um, and, and it's something to think about too, that our just kind of in general, the idea of our landscape mountains are always changing because the plates are always moving. Whether it's true, you know, yeah, some move at different spe- speeds and they do change their speeds over time, but um, that's that makes sense with the the freeze thaw that it would also affect the faults and and the plates themselves. So then, my question is really, how much pressure is that? Because in my head, I'm thinking like, oh, this must this glacier that's sitting on top must be really heavy to move enough that whoop up the plate goes and magma spurts forth. Like that seems like a lot more pressure than a chunk of ice would exude. But maybe I'm just really bad at guessing weights. I don't know what the weight of a glacier is, <laughs> but um, if you think about when we were like when the glaciers were, when you think about like we lived through it, um, but when the glaciers were um, receding at the end of the ice age and they leave behind these massive, you know, cuts in the crust and that's how we get rivers like the Colorado river was from the glaciers. Um, that's valid. Yeah. I mean, even look at, um, Boulder field and your, and the mini Boulder field by your house growing up. Um, they, those are left. The, the rocks are left there from glaciers. So they can move. I know they're pretty strong. I know they move and they're strong. Uh, but the pressure just seemed a little like off balance there. However, when you said you don't know how much they weigh, again, consulting the Oracle, um, it depends on how big they are. However, the large ones that we think of in terms of causing sea level rise and things like that, like the standard one that we picture in our brain can weigh more than 10 million tons. So um, that sounds like a lot of tons. <laughs> so okay wow let's so is what is um so we can try to compare like that to a normal thing like a normal thing my husband's car is one ton he keeps telling me because he has to pay attention when he drives tree trucks what roads he can take and I'll be like oh don't cross if it's this many tons and he'll tell me oh this truck weighs this much and I'm like that means nothing so he always tells me my car, which is a two-door Honda Civic, is about one ton. All right. So ten is million. it 10 million? So 10 million Honda Civic. <laughs> <laughs> That's an incredible amount of cars. This is a good comparison, though, especially as Americans. Tons is not, yes, it is a normal metric used, but unless you're in like a construction world or something that you're actually using that metric, it's not something that we're like, okay, yeah, I know what that means. Yeah. I read somewhere long, long ago that the brain kind of stops counting at five. And that is a very recognizable number for us. So if we like throw out M&Ms onto a counter and there's five or less, the brain can look at that and be like, boom, five immediately. But if there's more than five, the brain is like, that's an excessive amount. Uh, We need to sit and now manually count them, which we can do. But then when I think of tons, right, it's just so unfathomable. Yep. It's beyond five (laughs) M&Ms. So there's that, if that helps with my tiny little bird brain. (laughs) (laughs) I always like to think about like a comparison. I like when 
you're seeing something yeah. at length and it's like, this is this many football fields. I'm like, okay, I know how big a football field is. That yes. Is you were in marching band. You know very well how big a football field is. Lots of football fields. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's nice. 10 million Honda Civics put a lot of pressure on the earth's crust. All right. Yeah. So yeah, as they slowly disappear, it's like the, like a seesaw going up and down. See, uh, I thought you said sea spa. I was like, what is that? That sounds, uh, it nice. sounds great. And I'm sure that as the magma vents flow into the mm-hmm. sea, somehow it creates some cool mm-hmm. thermal hot springs. <laughs> there we go. I wonder if, I wonder if, um, the change in ocean temperature or any other characteristics um, affects the plates of the ocean. Like, so, right. the, um, wow, words, um, barrier in ocean, ma- mountain range. Mariana ocean. Trench. Yes, there we go. Okay. Right, yes. The, the trench that goes in the Atlantic. down that all the deep sea creatures that like live in the vents live in. Yes. Yeah. Or any, I guess any of the deep trench areas where the crust is uh, pulled apart. And so parts of the mantle are exposed. I wonder if any of the ocean changes affect those trenches or affect the spacing, affect those plates. I truly don't know that one. However, the fact that you were saying earlier, you were thinking more originally along the lines of like soil health. I know pH is a huge, huge factor Mm -hmm. when considering soil health. And if there's the ocean acidification, how is that lowering of pH then impacting the quote unquote soil health of the ocean. We know it's impacting the corals. We know it's impacting like sandy environments, but yeah, those deep sea trenches, I would think a lot of the, although to be quite honest, a lot of the animals that live in those vents, they don't care. I know. (laughs) What is going on? Which is why they live there. (laughs) So maybe it doesn't impact the animal life, but and even is, is it affecting the water? This is not at all soil anymore um, it, because I didn't even think of this before. Yeah. Is climate change affecting those really deep layers of the ocean? I mean, they're, those are the areas that are least discovered or yeah. explored and least looked at. So I wonder if that's even something that's been thought of because in reality, does I'm going to say it doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter, of course. But in, right. in the right here and right now, um, does it affect the ocean? Right. Areas? I would think that, and now this is not me coming at this as a hydrogeologist or a oceanographer or anything like that. So I guess from that standpoint, you have a like third party separation, but I would almost be interested to be studying the animals like the water bears or the squids and stuff that live deep sea in terms of their resilience Mm. and try not studying them to be like, Oh, are you impacted? I'm so sorry. But to be like, Oh, are you impacted? Cause that's going to help us build our future space domes and bubbles and whatever weird mm. back to the sci-fi of like, <laughs> of like, how are we going to adapt to climate change and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and uh, crazy heat. I'm thinking like journey to the center of the earth sort of madness here. Yeah. Like how can we learn from them? Interesting. We'll have to think on this one. Yeah. Maybe I but just play I too much D and and love fantasy too much, but that's where my brain goes of why we should be studying them. <laughs> that's such an awesome thought. There we go. So yeah, if you, if any of you listeners 
know the answer, I would wonder why you are listening to like an intro to climate change chat. Um, but also if you are just for fun, please let us know. That would be interesting to find out. Yeah, I mean, I have an oceanography professor I could reach out to, but I can probably guarantee he does not know. <laughs> Sorry. And I don't, I know people who study water bears in the sense that they get really excited when they find a water bear in like a field ecology or stream ecology net. They're like, it's a water bear. And they share pictures of it, but not that they're like water bear <laughs> specialists. So yeah, if anyone works at NASA, <laughs> apparently you put out articles about the earth's crust so yeah there we go so thinking now I don't yeah I don't have a whole lot on how like the actual plate tectonics but in terms of soil health um there's a lot more there there is a lot more the issue is and this is probably my atmospheric studies brain constantly pulling in um okay <laughs> a lot of the hits to the soil health are directly related to weather events, um, which I'm noticing in all of our uh, discussions, I always right. go back to weather and I'm trying yeah. to keep myself from doing that. No, I think it's really interesting to see the theme throughout. It helps make connections. It's cool. It does. But for me, a person who makes all these connections, I feel like I need to stop and actually think about like how it's affecting this specific topic gotcha okay um and then piece it together but you're right it does the connection is everywhere and that's yeah one of the points yeah absolutely okay so lay on your your uh, soil health knowledge um so we've talked a lot about um I think we even talked about um soil maybe was it last week and how there's um the the dry areas of um, the country in the middle, right. the grasslands, all of those, which are coming from the droughts, obviously. And then on top of it, because of droughts, you're getting wildfires, mm -hmm. which just adds to your arid uh, climate and right. is going to make it even worse. Um, so I guess, and this is where my brain keeps now wanting to connect. And when there's wildfires, and um, the soil, the, the plants don't have anything to hold on to then when the soil is eroding. It's like my brain is pulling all these things together instead of focusing on in on the one. Um, well, that's where I'm going. Right now. So I have a question based on what you just said. A lot of plants, especially think of the shrublands or especially plants in an arid or semi-arid biome require fire germination. So when you start to bring up things like wildfires that are exacerbated by droughts, I can imagine that, I mean, everything in moderation, so mm -hmm. anything in excess is going to be bad. However, wouldn't in those areas, at least, when we notice an increase, uh, oh, no, because then plants wouldn't be able to live long enough to produce seeds. I answered my own question. Never mind. Um, and it, I mean, I think, especially coming from living on the East Coast and not being in the areas of the wildfires, right. I don't think a lot of the same areas get hit over, like, the exact same, like, patch of grass you know what I mean like <laughs> certain counties will get hit over and over different parts of the mountains right. but I don't know how common it is to have the same place because I mean if you think about it not a lot is going to grow in one year like you have a wildfire one summer not right. much is going to grow by the next summer so you can't really have a wildfire because there's nothing for that to hold on to so what I you kind of stopped your thought, but I think you're right. I think they probably could continue to grow to be able to go to seed. Right. Um, and you're right because wildfire, we do need, I don't want to say we need wildfires. We need burns, which is why, especially in Pennsylvania, controlled burns are very right. common because of things like that and keeping, keeping our forests healthy. Um, okay. But extreme wildfires are, yeah. are not great. No. And, it, and I, I always talk about this with, with just family stuff of, um, 
Oh, I might, <laughs> you, you're going to get an inside look at my diet, but, um, we'll be like, Oh no, I feel fat. And I'm like, no, you're not, you're not fat at all. It's okay. You can eat the ice cream as long as it is in moderation and we are not overeating ice cream or vice versa, overeating broccoli that can wreak havoc on your digestive tract with all that fiber all at once. Like everything in moderation. And it comes down to the weather and the climate change as well as it is not happening in moderation. It is happening right. again, too fast. Right. Okay. Right. So I know with soil, we've got a lot going on, um, in terms of, I mean, just so much, you've got the soil microbes, you've got uh, nutrient cycling, all sorts of things. So we can really connect it back to the terrestrial ecology. We can connect it back to water and ocean sciences with watersheds. Um, but in things like soil composition, I'm thinking like deep, I don't know, to me, this seems like deep soil, but looking at bedrock layers, mm -hmm. things like that, all the soil horizons, or those things impacted by climate change directly? Or is it all, do you think these indirect impacts ultimately trickle down? Um, I mean, I would think even just a change in temperature. So whether it's it, warmer or cooler, mm -hmm. um, since we've talked about, it's not just the earth temperature rising. Um, because it is decreasing in certain areas, I would think even just those temperature changes would affect the soil composition. Um, I don't know the science necessarily behind that, but, um, no, I guess that goes back to the freeze thaw cycles that happen. Right. Yeah. Because especially because, um, with the freeze thaw, you're going to, normally, I mean, there, there's normal level levels of freeze thaw, but in a uh, quote normal, what I would think a non-human induced climate change um, world, it would get, you know, you would get just to, to that cold level where there isn't as much freeze thaw because you're just going to be cold. Like let's say all of February is pretty yeah. much the coldest month and you're going to have the most freeze during that that time and then it starts to thaw out uh -huh. as you go into the spring but now we we've talked about how I mean even right now it's it's really cold obviously there's no freezing happening right now right. But it's October and it's really really cold and I saw on the weather in a few days it's going to be 70 degrees again yes yeah. so this is happening in the winter time then where you're having more of these extremes where you have the ice and then five days later, it's like 40 degrees warmer and then yeah. it starts to melt and then it'll freeze again. And so it's happening more. Right. So that it's not just the, the one time season. seasonal change. Exactly. And oh. um, this makes me think of permafrost, which right. is different than freeze thaw. <laughs> um, so thinking <laughs> of... of some of the, the areas in Russia where mm -hmm. there are permanent frost layers all the time. And it, yeah. it's, it's yay deep. I don't know how deep. <laughs> I mean, it can vary from a few right. inches or centimeters to feet and meters deep, depending on the altitude. And exactly. Yeah. Um, and I know this is a story a few years ago. And the permafrost was thawing so much faster than it usually does that it was releasing chemicals into, I'm assuming it was air and water, uh, like the ground uh -huh. water, as well as right. potentially into the air. Chemicals that were um, frozen in the permafrost. And I'm pretty sure, I, I feel like this was the story. There was like a whole group of reindeer that were dying because of the perma I think they linked it to the permafrost thawing and releasing oh all gosh. those chemicals let me try to see if I can find that because I feel like I remember this story 
because my mom was like, oh, the reindeer. Well, I just, uh, it's funny that you mentioned the, the reindeer. So there's the taiga and the tundra are the, the areas that would get that sort of permafrost layer. And I just was learning about a conservationist who is doing forest ecology work in the tundra with reindeer specifically and looking at how people could manage the health of their forest by living in harmony with these animals and the importance of herbivores in these forest environments. And for them, it's a boreal sort of tundra forest. So very different tree structures, but the important role that the reindeer play in the forest and how people interact with that. So if you're having these yeah. mass die-offs of reindeer due to the soil is thawing, you're going to have some really severe implications later down the line. Yeah. So here's an article from 2020 out of nature.com. So it's out of a story, perma or a story, an article, permafrost dynamics and the risk of anthrax transmission. Anthrax. A recent outbreak and recent outbreak of anthrax disease severely affecting reindeer herds in Siberia has been reportedly associated to the presence of infected carcasses or spores released from the active layer over permafrost, which is thawing and thickening at increasing rates, thus underlying the re-emerging nature of this pathogen. Okay. Well, I guess that kind of leads to another whole avenue of the, dis the viruses, the bacteria mm -hmm. that you said, the fungal spores that are being released from this layer that's been locked away for right. so long that now it's melting. And not that that's polio is from the permafrost, but we're starting to see reemergences of all these crazy diseases I think I read somewhere about some disease that like was locked in a in an iceberg that had like a human skeleton or something like that. And then it was going to release this super bug. Like, again, very sci fi yeah. sort of elements here of like, wow. Yeah. So there we go. Soil is uh, locking away all these diseases that we haven't been exposed to for so long. Sorry, now I'm going down in the down a rabbit hole. Yes, and how there there is an article saying that the uh, the pathogen can also affect the Nordic the nomadic uh, herders. Oh my gosh! Because yeah, I think that too. What? Okay, so so all these reindeer are. I'm gonna take these in a non health forward way, just because okay. it's it's a little too scary. But oh no, <laughs> <laughs> the reindeer are dying, and yeah. I remember that that article specifically that I had read did not give numbers, but it was in a, an alarming amount that they were losing. You have herder reindeer herders that I mean that's a major part of their culture in Russia right. and Siberia. So now, what do they do with going back to the cultural side of things? What are they going to do when they lose their entire reindeer herd? And it's the middle of winter, I guess. I don't know when, how long it takes to affect them, but they use the reindeer for food sources yeah. as well as um, clothing sources. Yeah. And I'm sure that is a source of money for them because they probably trade and sell them. Um, so now you're affecting not only the animals, which we love, but the people now are also being affected and in a way yeah. that, um, you know, developing countries we don't think of. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. No, that definitely has some implications beyond just, you know, at the beginning, we're both like, eh, hey, does it really matter? Do we really need to worry? And now I'm like, oh, yes. Oh, yes, we do. We do need to worry. Okay. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but not, and again, like you said, it could be really scary, but it's not, oh, we need to worry. Like we need to all be freaking out, but we need to be conscientious and aware of it because then we can do something about it. Exactly. Right. Um, yeah. 
So not that we're all going to take like snow blow, not a snow blower, what do they have on the ski slopes that create snow? We're not going to be creating false snows, but right. like you mentioned before with weather of, okay, well, let's be conscientious about where our energy comes from right? and things that would be warming the planet and causing these freezes to thaw, um, we can be a little more aware of that, I guess. Yeah. It's a, what can you do to save permafrost? Throw I'm ice cubes of, at it. <laughs> like I'm thinking of soil conservation. Right. That is a, that's a huge science. And, right. um, you know, that's been kind of in the U.S.'s mindset since the Dust Bowl. Right. Very long time. But we don't have permafrost. I mean, I'm sure Alaska has permafrost, but we don't live in no. Alaska. We're we not even on that Alaska. coast. So no, yeah, exactly. all of my experience. Um, so the nature center that I used to work at was actually a national historic landmark specifically for being some of the first pioneers into soil conservation methods and techniques okay. in agriculture. And so we're, we're a very conscientious organization about soil health, but it was specifically with erosion. Mm -hmm. So that's where all of my background comes from, as well as then um, if people listen to previous seasons of podcasts, I had Alexandra Schmidt on, who is a soil scientist. She was talking to me about soil, but it was also specifically in terms of gardening. Again, we don't have permafrost to worry about. So I truly like, okay. That's a whole branch of soil conservation exactly. that I'm so unfamiliar with. Yeah. And a lot of my soil experience is more soil science and not okay. the conservation side of it. Um, and just kind of the formations of soils and the different types of soils. Um, but that's got to be helpful for something that is, yeah. You know, you have that base understanding of soil in general and can then apply other concepts. Yeah. But I think in terms of permafrost, yes, I knew it existed. But to be honest, until my mom told me about the reindeer, <laughs> like, because I can, now that I remember this, like, we guys were talking about it, I was like, man, I remember that being a really big deal. And I remember my mom talking about it all the time and about the reindeer. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, and that goes down a whole nother like topic of um, understanding different parts of of the earth and the you know the different we talked a little bit about being able to travel and understanding cultures but also understanding the other um, other climates the other environments and landscapes that affect other other parts of the world that we don't necessarily see no matter where right. you're located and and by that travel and experiencing these other climates like you're saying we can also experience how these climates impact the people that live there so again relating exactly. things back to humanity because if people didn't want to care about the environment for the sake of the pretty plant or the cute reindeer we care about mm -hmm. the survival of our species and how people are existing with it. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Um, so talking about the the pretty things that we we enjoy. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the things you have noted is about um, the seed bank, and yeah. so we need seed banks to have the pretty plants that you like, yeah. the vegetables and fruits you like to enjoy. So how do you think? climate change is affecting the seed banks? Well, that that's all you. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> Truly, I put that as a note there. Um, so for those who, you know, you're not looking on my computer screen right now, I do have a series of little bullet points of questions that I have that I would like us to go over and find an answer to, which is what leads us to consulting Google and finding these cool articles. Um, but the seed bank was definitely one that I was thinking of as a terrestrial ecologist saying, hey, yeah. I know that plants are dispersing their seed and that there is a layer of soil 
So there is a layer kind of of soil where the seeds from the plants fall and collect and they may lie there dormant until decades from when they fall. It's, they just stay there until there's optimal growth conditions. Some of them need to be germinated by fire. So they'll kind of bide their time until a fire comes by, germinates them and huzzah. And we have a remarkable amount of seeds in the seed bank. So if there are these natural disasters or a lot of plants get wiped out, we know we're gonna see some new growth, which is really cool. But in my head, I'm like, well, what if those weren't there? If something happened to that layer of soil, because I see all the connections, we're here talking about all those connections, what would happen? And um, is there something happening to the soil that would be impacting those poor little, poor little plants? So other than just kind of the very, very high level of kind of what, like, you know, are, are the weather events going to blow these layers away? Are they gonna get washed away? Um, that my brain goes very, very high level um, to that. So I yeah. am looking at an article from uh, a university in Hawaii, which is fun. Um, seed bank deposits and the emergence of vegetation have varied greatly due to climate change. Windblown seeds have taken over some seed banks, so the natural vegetation is inhabited from being expressed. Climate change has also allowed repressed seeds in the seed bank to grow due to the change in optimal growing conditions. So there's a positive yeah. twist of it, which I probably wouldn't have thought of if it was not brought to me. Well, um, I guess this really goes back to the bird thing that we had mentioned as well. Right. Like we're seeing different birds that we've never seen before, and that's spurring new generations of conservation scientists. Well, right. now we're seeing these new plants that are growing. That is really cool. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of that. I have Sorry, to. Sorry, I'm now. Yeah, it's cool. No, it's super cool, and we could definitely uh get really crazy with some of this too i i can imagine that would impact agriculture in a very unique way as well right that's where i was thinking of that too when you were talking about um the nature center i didn't even really i guess i did um but we're talking about like how you broke up these our series um i didn't even think of agriculture as kind of a separate part yeah. of that because it is it's it's not you know um that probably climate. would have been between the terrestrial ecology and then what right. today's was supposed to be uh, right more land use yeah, exactly um and I think that that's a whole nother part of climate change studies that um us as the science people we're focused right. more on how it's affecting the natural world compared to the cultural and social science people who are going to look at how human caused climate change is affecting humans yeah. <laughs> and our normal human world um, in terms of agriculture and different industries. Yeah. That's just Which beyond where my I, brain thinks. Yeah, I guess that's why I didn't break it up that way was because I'm not a social scientist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in my head, I'm like skipping right over that. Exactly. Uh, but it is a very important, an important layer to be considering. Um, yeah. Because ultimately, we're, again, everything is connected and we are a part of the ecosystem as well. Yes. So, okay, so we've got yeah, all the things that I had really brought up were erosion, desertification, things like that. And now here we're talking more about the permafrost and I'm finding myself being way more fascinated by that or yeah. at least seeing clearer 
kind of implications of it. Um, I know. To be honest, yeah. This uh, the um, the soil seed bank is. This is something I have not been exposed to. I knew it existed, but I didn't. I've never really looked into it. And this, I want to read this entire article that's written here because it's it is quite impressive. Um, but they're even talking about how these are things I would have thought of. Fast growing plant species will respond more during climate change than slow growing species. Makes sense. Be, right. Because everything is changing so quickly. And it's just, I, I wouldn't think of it like that. And, and that the fact that this article will focus in on the, the actual seed bank and, and how it's affected. So I, this is right. super interesting for me. That, well, that's awesome. And this is kind of, um, I guess one of the goals that I have for this specific mini series is, I mean, neither of us are true climate change scientists. We are both scientists who happen to have studied earth science or biological science to know some implications of climate change, but more of just bringing some new maybe general knowledge as well as then kind of inspiring people to think about it in different ways which is really cool that we are both doing as we're going through. Um, one of the kind of, I guess, I don't wanna say lessons, but points that I like to drive home when I am teaching about foreign wildlife. So our exotic species, one of my favorite examples is with giraffes and thinking about how people here in Pennsylvania can be impacting giraffe populations, despite the fact that we don't even share the same continent, but it kind of ties in with seeds. And giraffes kind of role in the ecosystem very generally to break down is they feed primarily on the acacia tree, which is what dots uh, think like the Maasai Mara in Kenya and Tanzania. So that tree, they feed on that and they can get pollen stuck to their super crazy long tongue and their mouths, things like that as they're eating. And then they're spread, they go walk from one tree to the next. And in that time, they poop out all the seeds that they ate, which allows uh, these seeds and a nice little packet of fertilizer that then grows up if the soil is right and conditions are right. And so they'll be planting and acting as a seed disperser, acacia tree can ultimately provide really great habitat for tea and coffee that are grown in Kenya. So then we're over here drinking, if you've ever had Kenyan coffee beans before, which is a pretty common one, like that Guatemalan, you know, they're pretty common. So we're being directly impacted by these giraffes acting as seed dispersers and how tying that back to the weather of if we're not having adequate rain to then be germinating the seeds and the seeds can fall into that seed bank, but then you can have a, the kind of like a dust bowl or desertification mm -hmm. occurring where the winds are strong enough to like just rip up the plains because the acacias can't pop up and grow and hold on. Mm -hmm. So again, like giraffes can help mitigate climate change sort of weirdness, but yeah. going back to that's their role in terrestrial ecology and that impacts the seed bank, which impacts right. the soil health, which is impacted by the weather. So really just one big system. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's an awesome example. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm biased, but I know. <laughs> so I can't okay. see a giraffe and not think of you. Yay. Ever. That's good. <laughs> I hope that everyone listening to this podcast has by now learned that I love giraffes and the color yellow. Those are kind of like the two things that just kind of permeate all of these episodes and that you guys all can't think of giraffes and not think of me. So as you're reading this, I know you're still reading it. Um, I, I, I moved on a little bit, but okay, I, that's save, okay. I saved the article in, okay, in good. my downloads box. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I wanted to see if I was missing anything of um, climate change effects on soil. 
Yeah, well, that was going to lead me kind of to my next question for you is in your reading of this article about the seed bank or whatever you're coming across, um, or what either of us have seen with the permafrost, things like that, what are some things that people can do to be protecting their soils, I guess, as well as then thinking bigger and thinking geological formations. Like up at the top, we, we said that the Sierra Nevada mountains are bouncing up and down. <laughs> How can we stop that from happening? <laughs> yes, Marissa and <laughs> Sam will be working to prevent the Sierra Nevada mountains from bouncing. <laughs> Just us, it's fine. <laughs> um, so interesting here is, uh, so it's an article, it's actually out of the European Environment Agency. Cool. Um, they're calling for um, activists to defend, restore and reestablish forests, peatlands, mangroves, salt marshes, natural seabeds, and other crucial ecosystems to let nature remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in their systems. Which would be a really great kind of all-in-one action because you're then mitigating erosion by mm -hmm. restoring these plant-filled ecosystems. Exactly. And you're also then removing the carbon dioxide or they're sequestering it, which is going to then slow the temperature change, which will allow the permafrost to go back to its homeostasis there. Right. Very so, cool. um, so I think this can be, I'm think this is probably on a, on a bigger scale. Um, so last week or whenever we talked about um gardening in your own space mm -hmm. but now if you can work on reestablishing forests so obviously um we're probably not going to regrow some of these major forests right. that we have removed or have been removed mm -hmm. but um I think we may have even talked about it a little bit in a lot of developing areas they're still required to plant a certain number of plants. Um, and while that's great, we also need to think about the reforest, uh, the reforest case, well, there's a word. Forestation? Maybe. Reforest um, uh, the I'm opposite thinking. of deforestation yeah. is reforestation. There we go. Um, yeah. I know in South Central PA, where I went to school, um, there were a few different areas. Actually, there, um, old growth forests. Oh, so been, cool. Yeah, that have been dying off, but there's a lot of push there to replant some of those forests to try to rebuild them up. Yeah. And so overall that will help. Now it's interesting because this article came out of Europe, <laughs> they did mention a few um, forest areas that we don't have. We don't have peatlands. I don't think there's any peat I think that there is like up near Maine. Maybe it's Can oh, maybe it's Canada. Sense. Um yeah. but I know that that's a huge issue because we have the overexploitation of peat bogs to create right. garden soil. Um so yes. finding soil that does not have peat in it is really important. And peat holds a lot of oh CO2. Gosh. Right. So and, and others too. I know. I think yeah. what it holds methane gas. Uh -huh. um, there's lots of different. Yeah. Peat is super important. Yeah. Peat, um, uh, peat is, is, another one is a huge sink for so much bad stuff. And we're just ripping it up and think of like, as you rip open a plastic bag, you let the stuff in the plastic bag out. Yeah. It's the same thing with the peat. So if we're ripping up peat to harvest it, to be using in our soil amendments, we're letting all that bad stuff out. So there we go. There's two things. Awesome. Not find peat free uh, gardening. Soil yeah. And try to um, help reforest some areas which probably is not going to be again as sam said 
done like on a more individual level. Um, don't try to reforest and create an old growth forest in your backyard. The trees need more space than that. But if you could partner with your local nature center or a community involvement day of being like, hey, let's do some tree plantings and not just trees that we think would look pretty, but yes. trees that are planted in the right spot and are the right species for this environment. Exactly. That probably would go a long way. Yeah. You could also check out, um, I don't even know if Maryland has this. I'm assuming we do. But in Pennsylvania, I know the soil conservation districts, mm -hmm. um, you could definitely check with them. I'm sure they have um, different advocacy groups that they partner with, or yeah. they may even do different um, events like this. Yeah, I, especially around Earth Day and around Arbor Day are like big hey, everyone plant trees with us. Although fall is a really, really great time to be planting trees because right now they're getting really great water and you don't have to lug hoses around all over the place and they don't have to worry about the heat and the, the crazy summer uh, right after they, they've been planted and that's stressful for them and then they have to adjust. So go, go plant trees, everybody. Excellent. So for what it's worth, everybody who can plant a tree and be a little more conscientious about what is in your bag of potting soil so that we can be protecting the peat bogs, the permafrost layers, everything's connected. And it kind of blew my mind as we were talking about it here. We'll all be making a huge difference in the health of the planet. I, the planet itself, the core, the mantle, the crust, all of the stuff that makes this planet up. So for that, thank you so much for digging deeper into the natural world with the Art of Ecology and with Sam Reba. If you enjoyed this week's episode, you can support, review, rate it, continue to follow along with it. Um, and Follow us on our social media platforms. I am on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube at The Art of Ecology. Sam, do you have anything to plug other than this cool seed bank article? Because I'm definitely um, going to have you give me that link so I can post it in the podcast description. I will. Um, I do actually have something else. Oh, cool. And um, talking about like traveling cultures is what mm -hmm. kind of made me think of it. This past weekend, we went to a museum in DC called um, Planet Word. So it focuses on language. Um, it's a free museum. You just have to make a reservation online. And um, one of the, there's like kind of two parts of this. The museum itself is super cool. And it Talk, the one of the exhibits right now is on musical language and how music is formed, which is awesome. Um, but talking about travel, the very the top exhibit um, that we thought was really cool, there you learn about different languages across the whole earth. They have this massive globe with lights and it like lights up and it shows you where you're located and everything. Um, and so it's just a cool way to try to connect cultures and, and make you think about it. And then um, one of the last things that we did was on advertising and marketing in different marketing languages. And so the point of what I'm getting at is <laughs> you can create your own ad because they have different topics. There's like six different topics. One of those topics was climate change, which I thought was really cool because the others were like sportswear and um, music or something. So it was really interesting that climate change was one of these. And then you have to create a slogan um, with the picture that they gave you. So the picture they gave for climate change, it's an ice cream cone and it has uh, an ice cream, like a ball of ice cream on top that looks like the earth. Okay. And somebody, so this is, it was visitor created, the, top, the slogan was save some for your kids. And of all the ones I had seen, I thought this was the coolest ad because um, my husband who did one, put, it did something about it melting. And I was like, nope, you're literally going against what Marissa and I are talking about. And then it's not <laughs> just warming. <laughs> so I was like upset with <laughs> that's what he thought of. But this is why we're getting education. 
<laughs> but the fact that somebody who visited this museum came up with this slogan to, that goes with an ice cream cone and earth. And I just thought it was really a really cool pull together of yeah. what we're doing and, and why you should be affected. I thought it was just, it was fun. And I thought I would share it. Well, thank you. That's and plug cool. the museum because that was fun. And so if you're ever in the DC area, not that there's, there's lots of museums in DC, obviously, but this was when we, we've been in the DC area um, for like five years, six years, and this is the first time we went, so. Oh, that's cool. Well, I'm glad you got to go. It's a good, it's a good plug. Well, that is a good plug for sure. Um, so I will be putting the links to those in the podcast description. Um, I'm also going to plug this we we've talked about it very briefly i had just watched a documentary um called earth a new wild which is by dr sanjayan who is a conservation scientist but he specifically is going around to these different places and looking at kind of the social science or the human element mm. of all of these conservation things so one of his kind of things that he says at the start of his documentary is he loves that all these other documentaries are so beautiful, well crafted. They tell these intriguing stories about wildlife and wild places, but they always miss out on the crucial element of where are the people that are in these ecosystems as well. So he kind of talks about both of them and he did one with the reindeer in, in the tundra. So that was the interesting aspect. So I'm going to plug Earth and New Wild, which is through PBS find that, that. yeah but otherwise thank you all for joining us and we shall see you next time on the last episode of this mini series where we talk about specifically where we find our hope as scientists and just as people despite all of kind of the scary stuff and how we can be taking a look at how we can be making the world actively a better place. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Bye.